Mm-hmm. We'll get started on recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a um, there's a what they call a a coke or a kukin. <laughs> there's a kukin that is stated um, within the Torah or the Psalms tell us that Yah has designated a um, a kukin. And that designation is for the new moon and the full moon. And on such a time as that, we're commanded to blow so far. Okay. And I want to do that for us. And again, after that, we'll pray. Hallelujah. 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 Appreciation belongs unto you, Yahweh. We thank you, Yahweh, for this opportunity to come to you today. On Rosh Kodesh, the new moon, Yahweh. Torah Rabbah, Yahweh, for the Torah Theka. Thank you for your Torah. Torah Rabbah, Yahweh, the Mishpat Thank you for your Mishpat Tim, Yahweh, your judgments. Torah Rabbah, Yahweh, for La Moadim. Thank you for your Moadim and your appointed times. Hallelujah. Kusayawa, be merciful unto you, Amika, to your people. Hallelujah. Lamadanu Yawa. Lamadanu the Amika. Hallelujah. Teach us Yawa. The La Torah. Hallelujah. Toda Raba Yawa. Zikarka Yawa. Please remember the Bedrith Yawa. Medinishpa to Avateka. Avraham, Yiska Kanyao Ko. Thank you for the covenant that you made with our fathers, Yawa. Remember our fathers. Remember Mount Sinai and the Bodriti, the Amikai, the Zereka, the covenant you made with the descendants of our ancestors. Hallelujah. 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 Praise be to Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of you, hallelujah. Praise is, um, praise is indicative of a, a different type of mindset. You know, before when we were Christians, we thought that we had an understanding of praise and we thought we had an understanding of prayer and how um, far off we really truly have been. Um, Yah loves praise. And one of the kings of Israel, the second king, his name is King Dawid. He had a mind for Yahweh. His mind was very much like Yah's. And he had a really intimate relationship with Yahweh. I wanted to share a little bit out of a psalm that he has written in Psalms 139. I thought it would be applicable um, considering how things are going in our lives and all the challenges that we face. And it goes right along with our Torah portion that we're reading about the tribe. The intimacy with Yahweh is about prayer. Intimacy. See, with Yahweh is about study. It's about having a close relationship with him. And we can, we're not going to be as close as we can about living in his presence. That's a whole different closeness. But right now, what we're trying to do is build that relationship. 
We don't want to put Yahweh on the back burner. That's what I'm saying. Now, we had said this in Psalms 139. You could write this down for your review later on this week. It's something you should meditate upon. He said, you know, Yahweh, you have probed me and you know me. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> you know me very, very well. You know when I sit and when I stand. And Okay, you discern my inclinations, my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my daily activities, and you are so familiar with all my ways that before I speak even a word, Yahweh, you know all about it. You have hemmed me in, both behind and in front, and you've laid your hand on me. Such wonderful knowledge is beyond me. It's too high for me to reach. Where can I go <laughs> to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to the Shamayim or the heaven, you are there. If I lie down in the grave in Sheol, you are there. If I fly away with the wings of the dawn and land beyond the sea, even there your hand would lead me. Your right hand would hold me fast. If I say, let darkness surround me and let the light around me be night, even darkness like this is not too dark for you. Rather, night is as clear as day. Darkness and light are the same. For you fashioned my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you because I am awesomely made wonderfully. Your works are wonders. I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes could see me as an embryo. But in your book, all my days were already written. My days had been shaped before any of them existed. Elohim, how I prize your thoughts, how many of them they are. If I count them, there are more than grains of sand. If I finish the count, I'm still with you. Elohim, if only you would kill off the wicked. Men of blood, get away from me. They invoke your name for their crafty schemes. Yes, your enemies misuse it. Yahweh, how I hate those who hate you. And I feel such disgust with those who defy you. I hate them with unlimited hatred. And they have become my enemies too. Examine me, Elohim, and know my heart. And test me and know my thoughts. See if there's in me any hurtful way. And lead me along the eternal way. Hallelujah. Wah. What stuck out a little bit to me, not that nothing, all of it didn't, but what really got me is um, where it said that all of my days in Yahweh's book are already been written and all my days have been shaped before any of them even existed. I want to take that little excerpt right out of there, that little piece right there, and let you know that no matter what's going on in your life, everything that you and I are experiencing has already been written out and is something that's supposed to have happened in your life. It's already been there. It's not nothing new to Yah. Yah already knows every single day that you and I are going to have. He knows about our good days. You know about our bad days. He knows, you know, when you and I are going to, you know, be sick. He knows when you and I are going to recover. He knows the day that you and I are going to pass away. He knows the days that we're going to be crying and the days that we're going to be full of joy. Yah knows all these days. And because of this intimate relationship that um, Malek Dawid had with him, which is Malek as king, had with the creator, he understood that. He understood that, you know, everything about him in his life was being shaped. Yah was using every experience that he had to bring him closer to Yah. So there is nothing new to Yahweh about us. There's nothing new. He understands who we are. And that just magnifies who he is and the greatness of his power and his majesty. For Yah to know, you know, every detail about our lives, to tell you that, you know, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's very amazing. And it's actually pretty scary because it means that we're going on a whole nother level. We're not dealing with the human being. Okay, um, we're, we're dealing with the king of the universe. Okay, and this king of the universe in chapter number 31 
of our Torah portion says to Moshe that he wanted them to go to war. I want you to go take vengeance on the Midian. <laughs> and after that, you're going to be gathered to your people. Again, I believe if we've read um, in our last Torah portion, what did, what did, what did Balaam or Balaam, what did he say that he wished that he would die like who? <laughs> like the Israelite. He said, I wish that my death would be like theirs. He, that's what he said. And guess what? His death wasn't like Israel's. <laughs> Did you read the Torah portion what would happen to him? <laughs> Did you read what Yah did to Balaam or what he had Israel do to them? Yah had him killed. <laughs> By the sword. Yah killed him by the sword. Okay. All right. So Yah used him and then had him kill because let's continue to read. Moshe said to the people, well, I don't want to go too far. Let me just stick right here. We gather to your people. Do you guys understand what that means? Tell me what you think gather to your people mean. It means that you're going to die and go to Sheol with the rest of your uh, yeah, ancestors. Our ancestors. So when Yah talks about being gathered, okay, remember that's part of our lesson about being, because we're asking Yah to gather us, right? That's what um, Kabatsenu means, is to be gathered. It comes from this word called kabats or kwabats. And kwabats means to gather like you would gather wheat during a certain harvest season, okay? That means that your time has ended and your work is finished. Okay. That means your growth, there's nothing else to do. You're done. Okay. So you and I are going to come to this point in our lives. And when we do come to that point, either you're going to be gathered to your people or you're going to be cut off from your people. If you notice in the Torah, Yah talks about gathering and he talks about cutting off. Okay. Okay. Yah cuts people off from their people, okay? Meaning that Israel is a special classification. <laughs> You're special. You understand? You are special. You are a segula. You have been picked, handpicked, and designed, and handcrafted by the creator of the heavens and the, and the earth and everything in it and the universe, okay? So we're talking something completely different than what we've been told. We've been told, oh, yeah, you were all, you're, we're all God's children. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's only, Elohim only has what he calls uh, a son here on earth, okay? And you probably heard it before, but let me share it with you one more time. We'll come back to this in just a second. Where am I going? Somebody tell me, I'm going to the book of, Exodus. And I'm going to talk about what the creator told Moshe to tell Paro. Okay. Which they call Pharaoh. His name is Paro. He told him something in verse number. Uh, what is it? Was it four? Is it four and ten? Where's it going to slow Hi, guys. Welcome back to Crafty Cabbage. Today I'm going to teach you guys how to make a word search for you. Hello. Can you, can somebody put their, the way to do it only takes about five minutes. No making accounts, no nothing. Hello? Without further ado, let's get started. Okay, guys, so go on Google or your Wow. Okay. All right. So here we go. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened, who that was. Um, okay. Uh, persuaded him. All of four and twenty. Uh, see, I lost my tra my train of thought. Okay, Yah is telling him. Oh, here you go. Praise Yah. All right, so Yah is sending Moshe to um to Paro. But listen, what he says in verse number nineteen. I mean, verse number nineteen of chapter number. Uh, 18. Okay. He says, Moshe left to return to his father-in-law and said to him, I beg you to let me go and return 
to my kinsmen in Mitzrayim to see if they're still alive. And Yithro said to Moshe, go in peace. Yahweh said to Moshe in Midian. <laughs> okay, this is where he was hanging out. He was in Midian, all right, with his father-in-law. You understand? Go back to Mitzrayim because all the men you, who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moshe took his wife and his sons and he put them on a donkey and started out for Mitzrayim. Moshe took Elohim's staff in his hand. And Yahweh said to Moshe, when you get back to Mitzrayim, make sure that you do before Paro every one of the wonders I've enabled you to do. Nevertheless, I'm going to make him hard hearted and he will refuse to sin, not let. This is called shal shalak, to send the people away. Then you are to tell Paro, says Yahweh, Yisrael is my firstborn son. Okay? He's my firstborn. I have told you. <laughs> I have told you not to let my son go, but send my son to me in order to worship me. But you have refused to let him. So you can see Israel is being used as a plural. Okay. And he's also used as a singular. Okay. Let him send him away. Well, then I will kill your firstborn. If you don't send away my firstborn son to come out and worship me, I am going to kill your firstborn son. And he's not, Yah doesn't have any respect of persons. Okay. Look at what Yah says to Moshe before we go back to our Torah portion. At a lodging place on the way, Yahweh met Moshe and would have killed him. Had not Zipporah taken a flint stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, she threw it at his feet, saying, what a bloody bridegroom you are for me. Zipporah name means to be quick and to be swift like an eagle, a bird of prey. OK, so Yahweh was going, Yahweh was going to kill Moshe because he did not circumcise his son, his firstborn son. See, so you see, Yah here, he doesn't have any respect. According to being part of the covenant, one must be circumcised. I brought you there to let you know that the creator that you and I serve looks at us as his, his son. That's, that's who we are as a, as, a, as a nation. Okay. And within the son is his sons and his daughters. So when you and I are gathered to our people, it's a special group. You're a special group of people. Okay. But if you don't do what Yahweh says, he says, I'm going to cut you off from your people. All right. But he's telling him, this is the last thing you need to do before you, you leave. Okay. So Moshe said to the people, okay, really the sons of Israel, equip men from, from among yourselves for war. They are to go and fight the Midian in order to carry out Yahweh's vengeance. On Minyan, you are to send to war a thousand men from every one of Israel's tribe. Tell me what tribe did not send anybody to go fight? Lewi. Lewi. Why did not Lewi go or fight? Why didn't he go fight? They were for service. Of Yahweh. Air for service Yahweh. under Yahweh. Okay. All right. And so what we're going to see here is there is a order. Okay. There's an order. There is one uh, Kohanim that did go and he went and he blew some, some trumpets and he brought some of the vessels with them when they went to war. Um, we're going to get a little bit more into detail about later on what the, the spoils of war, probably on Shabbat. But what I want to bring out the point of this part of the lesson is that they sent 12,000 men, a thousand men from each tribe, except for the tribe of Lewi. And these men were armed uh, from, for battle. What's interesting is that the, this is the new generation, the older generation that are men for war. Remember, we just did a census and we showed the numbers. So now from last week, we showed you the numbers and what those numbers were. So these men now are ready. They're equipped. They have a different type of mindset. Okay. And this mindset is 
quite different from the last group. Somebody tell me some of the significant differences between <laughs> the last group and this group. <laughs> You see some uh, individuals with a lot of zeal. Uh-huh. So we see more than just, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Yehoshua. We see more than just Yehoshua. We see more than Caleb. So we see this next generation who's willing and ready to go. When he talked about getting these individuals, 1,000 from each one of the tribes, and they represented and he mustered them for war, it was a process of preparation. That's what it was. It wasn't like a one day deal. It's like they were probably sharpening their swords, getting ready to, and understand what it was. They picked the best men that they could out of their tribes who represented their tribes, which is their clan and their family. Um, and then also too, what we see here, and what we'll see for the rest of this uh, week is the majesty of Yahweh, okay? So they're, they're, they're going on a command from the creator to take vengeance upon the enemies of Israel. So Moshe sent them a thousand from each tribe to war, okay, which is a va. That's an interesting. Uh, the Hebrew word for this is the same word that's called, uh, spell it right. Uh, that'd be a VA, but it's really a, a bet. It's called Zava, okay? And Yahweh's name is called Yahweh. And then he calls his name, what? Zava Oath. Yeah, so he's Yahweh Zava Oath, and his is his Zava. Yisrael, Yisrael is an army of men, okay? Of men of the age of 20 years old and up, okay? Except for the tribe of Lewi, all right? And Yah has an army, and he has armies not only in Yisrael, but he also has armies in the Shamayim in the heavens, okay? He also has armies of animals, and he has armies of insects. He has armies of everything, okay? That's why he sent in the locusts. He sends in the flies. He sends in the... Um, Tell me some other things that he sent in. He sent him um, some of those other creatures. Is it li uh, lice? Is it lice? Lice in. He has armies. He has he has weapons of war. Somebody tell me some of his weapons of war that he uses. What's his weapon of warfare? I guess fire. Uh, and yes. Fire. Famine. Lightning. Famine. Yes. What else? Drought. Drought. Yeah, he uses the drought. You understand? He uses, he says he uses the, he can use the sun for that. He uses the wind. He uses the snow. He uses ice. He uses plagues. Yah has a great deal of weaponry. Thunder, lightning, darkness. Darkness is one of his weapons too. He puts the enemy in the darkness. He gives them fear. He puts fear in their heart. He makes them terrified. He scares them. He, break, he breaks out on them. So why is he, he bringing this out? Because he's, this is the time where he's saying, I need you to go take vengeance. Because I don't like what they did to you. I don't like what your enemies have done to you. And what we're going to do is I want you to take vengeance on them. Okay. That's why you're here. Because I'm an Elohim of war. Okay. Um, remember, I've been saying Ho Wo Shienu, Elohe Yeshenu, Wakwa Betsenu, you know, Wahatsi Lenu, the Men Hagoyim, the Wai, the Hish Tabeaka, the Bithilitika. In one of the parts of the verse that you're going to end up continuing to learn, it talks about um, how we're going to give victory and praise to Yah by Him destroying His enemies. And he uses war. Yah, when Yah talks about delivering us, he's going to deliver us by his power, the strength of his arm. Okay. So, and when it says that men are going to be turning, faces turning greener, like they're men having babies, it's because when they see what's coming, there's nothing that they can do to turn away from it. it it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Okay. Yahweh Zavaoth is his name. 
and he's going to seek vengeance. Okay. Cause y'all will bring war. That's what he does. Okay. And so that's why he tells us, don't be afraid about what you're going to see. So Moshe, um, he sent these men and then also to, he sent them and Pincus, you know, the one that he gave a covenant forever, the son of Eleazar, the Kohen to the war. Does anyone know why Pincus was sent? Why would y'all send Pincus? Pincus to spy? Wait, did I get it wrong? He sent Pincus to war and what, because when the, when the Kohen, when there's any war, there's always a Kohenim there. And the Kohenim are supposed to be there sounding the trumpets and, and bringing the holy utensils. In some cases, it would be, um, uh, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant. But in this case, I don't, I don't believe it's the Ark because it says the Calais. It's not the Ark of the Covenant. And they also bring the trumpets. The trumpets are to sound an alarm to tell the people when the attack. And he would also be there to tell them that Yah was with them. And he's also there to instruct them and give them instructions. He's so really the truth of the matter is the real commander of the forces of the armies are the Kohanim. You have to be able to see and understand this. So you and I are not part of a religion. You're part of a family of, of people who are are going to be about war. This is where you come from. You're part of a family is part of a war. Your part, your Elohim is an Elohim of war. That's who he is. Okay. And he calls himself the king of glory. That's who he is. He's the, what they call the Malek HaKavod. And he asked, well, who is this king? You know, the Meh, you know, Meh, who? You know, Mohuze. Who is this the Malek HaKavod? They say Yahweh. Yahweh is Zeus and Yahweh Wagabor. Yahweh, uh, the Wagabor and the Milkamad, the one of, of war. This is in Psalms 24. Yahweh is an Elohim of war. Okay. And so that's not attractive. That's not attractive. We want, we were told we want to be with a God of love. Our Elohim does love us. Okay. But he doesn't love the world. He doesn't see and send his son so the because he loved the world, so he sent his son, his beloved son. You know, Elohim loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have every eternal life. That's not Yahweh's way. Yahweh's way is to seek vengeance upon Israel's enemies, and that includes people we even within Israel. You read in the book of Judges, you find out that Yahweh had decided. Guess what? It's time to let some of Israel die by fighting with their brothers. And they're going to wipe out the whole entire tribe of Benjamin for their heinous criminal act that they've committed. Go a little bit in that on Shabbat. OK, so Yahweh allows things to happen. Um, so he sent them to war um, and then. Pincus is there to give the instructions and to tell them how to proceed. So they fought against Midian as Yahweh had ordered Moshe, and he killed every male. They killed the kings of Midian, along with the others who were slain, Eve, Rechem, Sur, Hur, and Reva, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Bilam, the son of Baor, with the sword. Okay, So he got killed too. He got slaughtered. So after Yah used him, because he was Yahweh's servant, he would do things for Yah. He would consult Yah on different matters, and Yah would tell him what it was. So Yah has relationships with people who are not just Israel. Yah has relationships with whoever he wants to have a relationship with. Okay. The people of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones, and they took them at took, they took his booty and their cattle, their flocks, and other goods. When you read this part of the Torah portion, you probably winced a little bit at it because you don't fully understand why Yah has said what he's going to do. Okay. They set fire to all their cities. Because that's what God told them to do, to burn everything through Pincus. I need you to destroy everything. Um, I need you to destroy all the areas that they live in. I need you to destroy their camps. And they took all the booty, all the people, all the animals they captured, and he brought the captives, the booty, which is in the spoils and, and the possessions to Moshe to Elazar, the Kohen, and the community of elders. They don't have it there, but it's what it says, the community of the Ada of Israel in the camp, the leaders of Israel in the plains of Moab across from the yard. And so Moshe 
and Elazar, the Kohen and all the community leaders went out to meet them outside the camp. Why? Why outside the camp? Because they were head in war and they were unclean. They were unclean. And you're unclean if you touch a what? Dead corpse. A corpse. You touch a dead corpse, a bone, shed blood, anything like that. A dead body. Okay. So he's going to go ahead and give them instructions. So, but Moshe was very angry. It says he was angry here, but the Hebrew word says that he snapped. He lost it like a branch. When you got a branch and you just you keep bending and bending and boom, it snaps. It just snaps out and, and, and little pieces of wood snap out. Well, that's what he did. He went off on the army officers and the commanders of the thousands and the hundreds coming in from the battlefield. And the reason why he went off was simply because they let the women live. Okay. And the reason for this is simply because the women were a problem for Israel because they're the ones who were used in order to bring upon the plague upon the people. Okay. Do you guys remember what I read to you just a few weeks ago that talked about what Yah said about the, the families of Midian? He said never to what, if you can remember. What did he say about those people? He says never to seek what? Seek their gods. Don't you ever seek their success? Don't you ever seek their prosperity? Don't you ever seek their good? Don't you seek their gods? Don't you seek nothing from them? Okay? Because there's enemies that you and I have that are eternal enemies for us. And we'll, as we continue to go through the Torah, you're going to find out who these enemies are. Okay? Amalek is one. Yah says never be cool with them. Okay? Even though Esau is our brother, he's still your enemy. Yah says don't mistreat him. No, he's your brother. You can't hate him, but I will. <laughs> The Midians, there are enemies. Moab, there are enemies. Okay. Amon, there are enemies. Okay. We got a whole bunch of enemies. And if there are enemies, then whose enemy they really are? Yahweh's. The Yahweh's enemies. Um, you and I have to understand that Yah has enemies. And as the king, remember, because Balaam had told Moab that. There has been Yahweh has acclaimed as being their king. Okay. Yahweh's our king. Right. And he's he's telling them, I need to take vengeance on these people. Now, here's the reason why they didn't share this in a few chapters back, but here they're telling you what Balaam did. And what we read in the Torah portion about Balaam, it never mentioned about his advice that he gave to um, Moab. He just told them, hey, you know what? This is what's going to happen to your people in the future. So what do we learn from this is that there's, sometimes there's things that you're not going to find in the actual narrative that Yah will answer somewhere else. So Balaam's advice, you didn't read it in chapter 22, 23, or 24, or 25 about the advice that he really gave. The advice that he really gave was to cause the people to go to this festival. So that meant that, remember, Balak told him, Once you, I told you I can make you rich. I can pay you. So he didn't want to make his trip without any, any payment. So what he did was he went and he gave advice. Yah did not want us to know about that advice at the time they were reading it. He wanted us to know about it right now. The advice that Balaam gave to Balak was, look, you can't defeat them because witchcraft don't work on them. And yes, I bless them. Because Yah has told me I have to say everything he said. So Balaam was working against, he was a, what you would call a double agent, as I told you. He's working not only for the creator, for Yahweh, okay, but he's also working for himself. He's looking for his own good. That's what he's working for. Why does Yah tell us this? Yah is telling us that I need you to be careful. You can say everything that Yah says. You can let his name come out your mouth like we read in Psalms 139. Dawid said they use your name for crafty schemes. This is what he's making reference to. People use Yahweh's name to get what they want, but they're not really 100% sincere with Yah, you see. So this in particular individual right here gave some advice that caused Israel to be part of this worship. Balaam knew he understood he had a relationship with the creator and he knew if anything that you did not want to do 
was to worship another God. So what he introduced them to was this is the way that you get them to worship another God. You get them to worship another God by inter, inter, having intercourse with them and bringing women to them. That's how we need to get them. We're going to get them through sex. That's where we're going to get them. We're going to get them through their lust. We're going to get them through that food. We're going to get them through that party. We're going to get them through that entertainment. That's how we're going to get them. And we're going to get the entertainment of the ways of the Goyim. Everybody who's outside of Yisrael is what they would call a Goyim. Unless they decide that they're going to join themselves to Yisrael and adopt our ways and our culture. That includes language, clothing, and everything. That means men would have to let their beards grow. Everything. You're, if you're part of Israel, you have to do what we do. That means you have to be circumcised. That means that you, you can't worship other Elohims. That means that you can't do certain things. The same laws that apply to us apply to you, except for there are some exceptions. Your name will never be on a stone in the, in the temple. Your name will never be on a gate. You will be joined. You're not going to be from this in particular family line. You're not from that line. But I'll let you join. But you got to get rid of everything in which you've got to leave your father's house like Abraham did. And you have to join up. That's what you have to do. But Israel has a problem with lust. They have a problem with food. And they have a problem with parties and entertainment. Because they want to follow the ways of the Goyim. This is how they get down. So if we follow their ways, this is what is going to happen to us. That's how we get caught up. So remember, I told you earlier that we have to be mindful about the invitations. And you got to be mindful of the parties. And you have to be mindful of those things. You might think it's really innocent, but you should really check it out. I went to a party at my aunt's house when I first came to this truth. And uh, when I got there, I thought, you know, surely I would go and I'm just doing my thing. People will respect who I am, right? Because they would think they're doing what they're doing. I'm doing what I'm doing. Surely they would respect me, right? Well, at that party, there was nothing but homosexuals, lesbians, <laughs> crab cakes, <laughs> crab dip. <laughs> Okay, lobster tails, shrimp cocktail, pork, barbecue. No one had, nothing was there at that party for me. I was scared to even touch the cheese because on the same tray, they had the ham and the cheese and all the other hors d'oeuvres. So you know what I had to eat? And my wife would tell you, we ate nothing but fruit. And only a cheese tray that only had other cheese and, and, and maybe a cracker. Why everybody else was had on the crab thing around the, the you know, <laughs> everybody's having a good time and they're drinking and the party's being um, catered by hom homosexuals. <laughs> the only thing that we could drink is drink the drinks. Really, we knew that was safe. <laughs> but even though the and wine, popcorn. you got to be popcorn. careful. Yeah. Package candy. Every, how was everybody looking at us at the party? Like, aren't you guys going to eat? <laughs> What's wrong? Right? I had a lot of bread and butter. Yeah, we had a lot of bread and butter. You understand? And we knew at that moment that we were not going to be able to go to any of these parties anymore. You understand? So, and, the, and the, filth, huh, the filth was everywhere. The filth was not only in the food, the filth was in the people. The filth in was the air, in the air, you know. It was attitude. It was, was ambiance. It was everything. It was in the music. It was in everything. It was, it, we felt like we were late. We were at the uh, Festival of Peror. <laughs> Literally. You understand? Remember, Peor had to do with the what? It had to do with the Feast of Rectums and openings. <laughs> Why are you being vulgar? I'm not being vulgar. I'm just telling you what it is. Y'all stand, stay out of the parties. Stay out of the rectum parties because that's where you're going. You may not think you are, but that's where you are, okay? So Yah's plague broke out on Yisrael 
on his community because of these people, because of this incident. Now he tells them to go kill every male among the little ones. So the women came out with their babies. They were being, Israel's being compassionate. <laughs> we killed all the males. But we let the little children live. And we let the women live. But guess what Moshe said? Kill all the, every male among the little ones. And I need you to kill every woman who's ever slept with a man. That's your Elohim. <laughs> that's, that's our Elohim. Okay, so somebody tell me, why does he want to kill the little ones and then the women who've ever slept with a man? So it doesn't fill out that bloodline. Okay, so we got bloodline. I like that. He says there's that bloodline of the little ones. Okay, the bloodline mm. is continuing. We got that women. Yeah. Women, they already contaminated. Okay, so we got the women. Okay, so they're they've already been defiled. And let's hear you from Samia. Um, so they don't expose and teach since women tends to teach the children. Um, oh, so they don't do the future generation, teach future ooh. generation. The women are the teachers. Good point. That's an excellent point. They're gonna teach the children. And guess what they're gonna teach them? Grievance. If they let them live, what they go, man, no. to tell me what they go tell their their kids. <laughs> their grievance. Yeah, they're gonna tell them their grievance to tell them what happened, aren't they? They're gonna tell them, hey. They're gonna teach them hate. <laughs> yeah, remember Israel? I mean Israel. Remember Israel came in twelve thousand of them. Remember, and they killed your father. So is y'all asking? Is y'all yeah. instructing Moshe? Go ahead, somebody. Go ahead. They're also going to teach them about their gods. Ooh, they know about their gods. Yeah. Point other Elohim. They're not gonna. Yeah, what woman is going to? I don't care if they came here and and the women are not gonna um, bow down. They're not going to, um, you know, surrender their gods. Wow. They're gonna, they're gonna continue to teach their children that. Wow. Because their Elohim is not Yahweh, right? <laughs> yeah. Good point. Somebody else give it to me. That's right. That's it's the purpose of having a tool study. Go ahead. What else can you think besides the gods in the in the being a teacher and instructing them in the ways of revenge and like can't say a bloodline, you know? Is it possible that their sons will grow up and, and mingle with the daughters of Israel? Mm, yeah. Uh-huh. So what are you guys telling them is through Moshe, is that the mindset <laughs> Goes with the body. Yah doesn't care about the body. He don't care about it. The most important thing that Yah care, and when I say that, what I'm saying is this, so I could be clear. Yah cares about the body and its function and how it's supposed to be used as a vessel to carry things, okay, to carry us and have us move around and be animated. But the most important thing, the part of our body that Yah cares more about than anything, is not even your heart rate. <laughs> it's your mindset. It's the mindset. It's what, because this Torah portion is about you making vows. It's about what comes out your mouth. You understand? You see? It's about those things. Would we have something? Let's see. Oh, per who's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somebody put up to prevent any further corruption. Yes. Excellent. You bring in something contaminated and you think that it's not going to affect the, the, the community. Look, look what he just told him. I just met them outside the camp. So you're going to bring these women in here that caused you to be part of a festival that they were defecating around and having a meal and having anal sex and all kinds of stuff. You gonna do that? You gonna bring that in here? <laughs> now, can you see why Moses snapped? Moshe snapped. He snapped. Okay, and he's gonna continue to snap. Why? Because he knows he's gonna be gathered to his people. So he's trying to put these points out. Those were excellent contributions, everybody. This is what it's about. Um, but the girls who have never slept with the men, I need you to keep them alive for yourselves. Is that keep them alive for yourself so you can go in and be intimate with them? Why are they keeping them? Because 
they can marry? No. They're slaves. They are going to be what you call a slave girl. Okay. And they can have that slave girl remain a slave girl. They can have to give that slave girl not to their sons. They could give that slave girl to another slave or somebody else. It's okay. a, a bargaining tool. Yeah. Yes. It's work. It's effort. It's, it's what you call a resource. Okay. So here's the deal. When they went in there, okay, when Yah sends them on their mission, it's not just to kill. <laughs> it's not just to kill. That's part of it, is to get the resources. Name some of the resources that they took back with them. Sheep. They took the sheep. Weapons. The, the cattle. Yes, they took the weapons. And, I guess, women. Yeah, the, 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 the servant girls. What else? Goats. Oh, got the goats. Cattle. Yep, they got the goats, they got the herds, they got the oxen, they got the donkeys, they got the gold, they got the silver, they got the uh, other precious bronze, they got a whole bunch of stuff. They got cookware, whatever they thought they wanted to bring back. And everything else that they don't need, they burn up. Okay? And those are the things which you would call the spoils or what you would say, the booty. Okay. There always has to be some spoils. Okay. Resources. So Yisrael was literally enriched by this. Any other reasons why they kept a slave girl and why, why not sleep with a man? Why could they have been, why could they have not have slept with a man? And has ever slept with a man. Why? The clean. Purity. What else? Lady couldn't even touch women. Because. Right. Can I say it? Yeah. Because if we wanted to use, like if I owned a slave girl and I wanted to use her to bring forth a child for me, she had to be clean. Right, but she couldn't marry none of Israel's sons, and he couldn't marry. No, she, she couldn't marry, but just like, uh, just like Abraham and Hagar. Ah, excellent. Can't be used as a surrogate. Ah, good point. So, were you saying like Hagar? Yes. I got you. No marry, just bring forth a child. Right. Okay. I'll buy that. Supported with the Torah. But then you have to find out whether or not Yah would say, because he did say that they can't enter his congregation, right? So you got to look at, we got to review the Torah because Hagar is an Egyptian and Yah doesn't have any quorums with the Egyptians, believe it or not. He does. He says that he's going to make a covenant with them, that there will be his people too in a different okay. setting, but he doesn't have any quorums with the Egyptians. Okay. But his well, enemies is completely different. Okay, then they were just um, slave girls. Then. Yeah, I guess because if it once it's like once you've been betrothed or you've been married or uh, it, uh -huh. it again changes your mindset. You're more dedicated to like if you've watched the Game of Thrones, you can never trust that woman because she's yeah. already been, um, you know, in covenant. If she's with, been with a, man. a man of her own people. Thank you. Thank you. So what it is, that's a great that's an excellent point. Yeah, you were going to bring out something. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying about purity and uh, using them as, as as like bond women to to like for power as they were being used for, towards Israel. Yep. Okay. So if they're sleeping, if they slept with a man, that they've already been been to a in a covenant, right? So they're bound, right? So there's a binding, right? So anytime a man and a woman are together, they bound themselves together, right? And so. Yeah, you got to look at this. Yeah, I'm saying I don't want anybody that's already been bound. That's why they're called a bond woman because they're binding themselves, bound and binding. Okay. So the binding is what Yah is talking about. You can't take something from somebody else if they're bound to it. Yah will not allow us to take something if they're already bound.
put it this way. Our Elohim is not going to break anybody's bounds or any binding agreements. He doesn't, he doesn't break uh, a covenant. He doesn't do that. He doesn't. Not in this, and not in this case, not in a situation of war. Okay. But it depends on who the people are. Because there are in the book of Deuteronomy talks about man goes out and he goes to war and he finds a captive woman. He can bring her back and shave all her hair off. But he's not talking. There's a certain group of people he said you cannot be with. OK. And he gives a line, uh, 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 you know, for sure. We know the people, the Kaananis and the Kiwi and the Yavusis and so forth and so on. So we have to be able to understand what group of people you're talking about, because Yah has certain groups that you and I just can't can't mess with okay um good points so they were instructed 19 to pitch their tents outside for seven days whoever killed the person or touched the corpse who have slain purify themselves in the third and seven days and your captive so the captives had to go through the same identical process also you need to purify every garment skin goat hair everything made of wood Elazar the Kohen said to the soldiers who had gone out to the front, right? This is the regulation. This is the Mishpatim from the Torah, or excuse me, the Kukim, not the, not the Mishpatim, the Kukim. This is the decree from um, the Torah. So this is the second time. Somebody remember on Yom Shalishi, what was the Kukim that Yah established for the husband and the wife and the, and the daughter and a, and a father? What is there? Is that a Kukim? Yes. Yes. So Yah introduces us to his kukim through your, your different experiences. So you have kukims that have to do with war. You have kukims that have to do with purification. You have kukims that have to do with relationships between a husband and his wife and a husband and I mean a father and his daughter. You have kukim blowing the shofar on you know, on Yom Rishon. Excuse me, Yom uh, uh, Rosh Kodesh is a coke it's it's a kukim it's one of the kukim okay so what we're doing is yes koti i was just wondering and correct me if i'm wrong but when you were speaking of bonding a woman being bond bonded a bind to a man um is that a, would that be another reason why yahweh would never have caused mary to be impregnated because she was already bound. So that discounts that birth right there. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. And it's against his, his name, his, his way of doing things. There's never been a woman who's ever been pregnant by a spirit that's foreign to us. Right. There, so if you look at all the women, like, let's just take a roll count. Right. So the first one you, you find out about is Sarah. Okay. Sarah, she was barren. Who's the next one? Rivqua. She was barren, couldn't have kids. Her husband prayed for her. Who else was barren? That right there I was. Raquel was barren, couldn't have kids. We had one last week. Kana. Nah. Barren, couldn't have children. You understand? In the book of Kings, there's another woman who was barren, couldn't have any, any kids. It's all this, this barrenness. OK. And Yahweh has taken these individuals. That have called out to him. And he's given them children through the act of sex between a man and a woman, sexual intercourse. Everything that Yah does. Is through the natural process. OK, so. All right. So when you look at this new way of getting impregnated. It has never been heard of. That is what you call witchcraft. There's no way possible. There's no way possible that a man, a, a woman can ever be pregnant by a spirit. That's de demonic. And, it's, and it's, it's witchcraft. And what is witchcraft? Magic. It's magic. That's where you get your magicians. So everybody in the New Testament is a magician. They're doing all kind of, if you notice, they're doing all kind of acts. Have you noticed in the New Testament, you deal more with demons and evil spirits? Yeah. 
You ain't never heard none of that in over here. You know, that's true. I was thinking about that very thing the other day. You never hear anything about it. You don't that. hear nothing. You don't hear about nobody casting out demons. You don't hear nothing. You do hear about an evil spirit that asks y'all for permission to go down and, and, and make somebody put a lie in somebody's mouth. <laughs> no speaking in tongues. You don't hear none of this speaking in tongues. You don't hear about this impregnated by the, a spirit. You don't hear about none of that. So why all of a sudden now, after all this thousands of years, now we're hearing about stuff that you ain't never heard of. Why was Jerusalem full of demons? When did they get? <laughs> huh? And it would just so happen to be all the, the children of Israel from the tribes of Israel who had these demons. When has it ever been okay for a woman to bleed for 12 years? When? When has it ever been okay for lepers to be, you know, available walking through the city? <laughs> I thought they were supposed to be outside the camp. When? You see? So our people are believing magic. And those are Yah's enemies. Those are the ones who want to believe that. I used to believe it. You know why I believed it? Because it did it mean I didn't have to change my ways. And it meant that I didn't have to follow anything. All I had to do was just believe. <laughs> it meant that I can eat anything I wanted to eat. <laughs> I can commit a crime like one of the men on the on the cross and just ask for forgiveness. And my crimes were intentional. <laughs> Christians want to talk about the grace message. <laughs> uh, this is grace. Grace is that I should be dead. But I'm not. I'm teaching the Torah. Yeah. You see? Well, they didn't know. You didn't know? You were just born in 1970. How could you know? Nobody nobody knows. That's the excuse that people are saying. Nobody knows. Let's, let's deal with that for a second. <laughs> you think these people in Midian knew what they were doing? You think it was a concerted effort? Or you think it was just on a on a on a government level? Only the kings knew about it. They knew. Everybody was involved. The women were involved. The kids knew about it. The men knew about it. Everybody knew about it. Balaam knew about it. What was Balaam doing in Midian? Remember, they came and visited him and told him to come. And they brought him, you know, hey, come out here. We'll, we'll pay you. So guess what it was? He got over there and he started relaxing with them. And they thought since the situation happened and Israel got plagued and then 14,000 people, you know, got killed. And they're like, OK, y'all's mad. At them now we're good. We can defeat them now. We're down there. We don't have to fight them, though, because their Elohim is going to do this to them. They knew what y'all was going to do. They knew it. How did somebody tell me? How did they know what Yah would do to Israel? <laughs> They've been keeping tabs on Israel. These are the same people that said they just came out of it, Mitzrayim. You don't think that Bilam told them who Yahweh was? He's at the party after the. He's after the after party. You see, everybody has their own goal and intention. And they'll do whatever they need to do. Back to the study. Elazar the Kohen told them, hey, this is what Yah has instructed through Moshe. A lot of us will go right over this and never think twice about it. This is the Torah. This is the Kukim that you and I get from the Torah that Yahweh has ordered Moshe. If you don't listen to what Moshe says, then you're going to perish. Guarantee it. I'll end the class with that. <laughs> if we don't listen to what he says and we ignore what Moshe says, 
and we said, well, that's old school. We don't want to hear it anymore. Then you're going to perish because Yah is only concerned with the things that, that he told Moshe. This is this. He, he didn't tell this to Paul. He didn't mention not one word to Peter. John has never spoken. Mark, Luke, Titus, none of them. Philemon, none of them. I don't care if it's John 1, the Baptist, the second Baptist, none of them. <laughs> I told a guy on YouTube, and I'm looking forward to his response. He's around talking about, you know, this Yeshua character, and he's, he's acting like, you know, he might be Jewish, and he's talking about he believes in the Messiah, and he's using Yah's name. He's using Yah's name. I invited him to a discussion. I said, hey, listen, why don't you just do a... a Let's mean you do a show together. You can come on my program or I can come on yours. Because I told him you shouldn't let Yah's name come out your mouth because you're speaking another name and you're giving glory to someone else. See, because people want to believe he said, well, Torah is all through the New Testament. I was like, well, let's discuss that. Let's let's have a conversation about that. The Torah is not in the New Testament. There's nothing in the New Testament that has a law and a dietary kukim about how you and I should uh, eat. There's nothing inside of the so-called New Testament that tells you what should be your, your dress. There's nothing inside of the New Testament that gives you a command about the Moadims. There's nothing inside of the New Testament where the creator has ever spoken one mumbling word of a command. They said, oh, I heard a voice. That doesn't mean anything for us. People hear voices all the time. You go down to the Napa State Hospital here in California, they'll tell you all the time they hear voices. <laughs> you and I are going to have to do what Yahweh says through his servant, Moshe. That's If we don't listen to him, we're done. We're finished. That's what he said. Okay. That's exactly what he said. We'll continue this on Shabbat. This week has gone by so fast. We'll continue. Thank you all for your contributions or your what you've what you've said and what you've added today to the study. And I want to just give you one last little thing before you leave. In Deuteronomy chapter number 30, it's one of my faves. I'm only going to read one, one or two verses, just one or two. When the time arrives <laughs> that these things have come upon you, both the blessing and the curse of which I, Moshe, has presented to you, and you are there among the nations, the goyim, to which Yahweh your Elohim has driven you. Then at last, you start thinking about what's happened to you, okay? And you return to Yahweh your Elohim and pay attention to what he has said, which will be exactly it's going to be exactly what I am ordering you to do today. You, and you had any question, your children, with all, call all your libi, your heart, and all your nefeshka, your soul. You understand? And then at that point, Yah will reverse your exile, and he will show you mercy, and he will return you, and what? Oh, there you go again, Kwabatsenu. Oh, from them, all the peoples, the Hagohim, okay. To which Yahweh only has scattered you. Okay. So that's the thing. That's what you and I are waiting on. But you and I are going to have to do. Pay attention to what he has past tense have said. Which will be and exist exactly what I'm ordering, commanding you to do today. You and your children. Where? Among the nations. It's not hard. Now, where does it say that in the New Testament? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Mary got impregnated by the Spirit. She sure did.
it's a miracle. <laughs> Any contributions before I let you go? Any remarks? Like, oh, oh, go ahead. No, I'm just saying great lesson. Oh, thank you, Fanta. Todoraba. Moto, G. S. Silas. Ramsey. I wanted to add that, um, you know, something that I noticed that when I did leave that uh, false religion, all that supposedly demonic activity just ceased. It just stopped. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, and as far as in my personal life. Yeah. And I really took notice of that. And it's like I wasn't warring against these unseen spirits, you know. I I needed to repent. <laughs> so that's it. yeah, how yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, you the whole time they got it. See what it is is they have to give you a character that you're fighting against instead of you having it. It's never you. It's always someone else. Have you noticed yeah. that? Yes. See, we're yeah. the problem, right? But why why you be the problem when you can blame it on the devil? It's right. And you have someone else to pay for. Yeah. Yeah. And why would you repent? Well, you don't have to. Yes. You don't even know what that means. You follow me. Yeah. Yes. So awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for your contributions. Thank you for your study. I really enjoyed teaching you. And I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you more often. Yes. Shalom. 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 Shalom.